Welcome to the Clarity Advisor Show, where you'll learn how to grow your team today. Join Ken Trubke and his guests as they discuss what works and doesn't work to grow your team in today's world. And now, your host, Ken Trubke. Hello, and welcome again to the Clarity Advisor Show. Hey, we all want to do work that feels purposeful, that has a mission behind it. And a lot of time that leads us into the not-for-profit space. But as a leader in not-for-profits, one of the challenges is working with volunteers as well as paid team members. Well, my guest today has been doing that for a number of years. Prior to that, she led a huge team with a large utility company. We'll get into all of that, but please welcome my good friend, Crystal Parker. Welcome, Crystal. Thank you so much, Ken. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's so great. So let's start with the Christian Chamber. Tell me about that and and how how you've been how you got there, I guess, really. And then we'll we'll back up after that. Well, I got there kicking and screaming, actually. <laughs> uh, but uh, I was always a Sunday Christian in the workplace, meaning that I would go to church on Sundays and then I would work according to my flesh during the week. And I just had an incredible opportunity to understand, you know, that abiding grace of God in the workplace and bringing in my background in business and helping Christian businesses succeed in their organization uh, by coming together in the marketplace Uh, supporting each other, praying for each other, referring each other, and being intentional about doing business together. And so that's really the premise behind the Christian Chamber of Commerce and how I got there. Okay. And you've been the executive director there for a number of years. Uh, Tell me how that came about, You, what you were doing just before that, and then how you got to the Christian Chamber and, and how you ended up as the executive director. Did I say kicking and screaming? No, I'm teasing. <laughs> I actually have my own consulting company, Intent and Impact. And I was actually a product of the Christian Chamber of Commerce. Most of my war market is in the Midwest, and I live in Florida. And so instead of jumping on an airplane every week to go and conduct business and work with clients, I knew that I needed to build some relationships because people do business with people they know, like, and trust. I needed to build some of those relationships in Florida, in Central Florida. So someone told me about the Christian Chamber of Commerce. And so I actually spent two hours with the president learning about the Christian Chamber of Commerce and joined as a member. And so that's actually how I got there. Now he went home immediately after that meeting and told his wife that he believed that I was supposed to take over the Christian Chamber eventually. And And that's exactly what happened. I really fell in love with the opportunity to serve Christian businesses and to be able to align that with my background in business and help them be successful. So I saw a great opportunity there to help grow the Christian Chamber of Commerce and launch the national U.S. Christian Chamber of Commerce. And uh, it's been quite a journey but a very rewarding journey. I still have my consulting business, my company, and I'm able to serve clients through that. But the main client that I have and my main focus is with the Christian Chamber of Commerce. Oh, that's great. That's such a good story. So let's talk about the team. On on the Clarity Advisor show, we tend to focus on what it takes to build and grow teams today. Some things still work, and they've always worked and some things are new and timely and we need to be aware of how things have changed. So for you specifically, you've got that mix of volunteers and paid teammates. So talk a little bit about how that works and what you've learned from leading a volunteer group and things that have worked and maybe some things that haven't worked. Yeah, absolutely. So coming into this, we had a group of volunteers that we call ambassadors. And at the time I was working alone independently. I didn't have a paid team that was working alongside me. So it was me and volunteers. And it was one of those things where, oh, you want to volunteer? Sure, come in. And there wasn't structure in place to help them be successful. It was kind of like, well, you say you're going to do it, but 
we don't know if you did. So it was there was no opportunity to inspect what we expected. And then there was a major issue, Ken, and that major issue was me because I had come from the corporate background and I served in corporate for a number of years. And so there was always an exchange. You do this in exchange for dollars. And so when I had all these volunteers helping me to move this mission forward, I felt like there was an element that I owed them something. And I got a very wise piece of advice. And that piece of advice was, hey, you serve in your church, right? Yeah, I serve on the worship team. I serve in the kids ministry. And he said to me, he says, do you expect anything back from the church? I said, no, I serve because I love to. I want to help. And he said, why are you trying to take that away from the people that are serving this mission? And it was one of those, wow, let me sit back and really think on that for a minute. I was trying to make an exchange when people were really trying to support, volunteer and serve the mission. And so when I was able to understand that, I was able to structure volunteer programs that tapped into the unique talents and abilities of the individuals that wanted to serve. Some people are wired for social media. Some people love picking up the phone and making phone calls. Some people would rather die than make phone calls, but they want to connect in meetings and help people. We have virtual ambassadors. So we started creating individual teams of volunteers based on their unique abilities and structuring it in a way that there was some accountability there. That way we would know, and it wasn't about holding them responsible, it was about serving our members. And we needed to know that our members were getting served in a way that we thought that they were. And so having that ability to have accountability, structure, and then deeply reach into people's passion to serve and their giftings and abilities and structure a program like that. We've grown our ambassador team significantly and we're much more effective through a volunteer army. Okay. That's such good stuff. I love the idea of tailoring work and roles to the, the natural types of people that you have and their natural strengths. That's so good. I'm, I'm struck by the idea of what, what that person, that mentor said to you about, it sounds like there was a part of it where you're like taking away from them, their desire to serve. It sounded like you were also trying to, to exert some positional authority, which is a very typical leader role in the corporate world when you really needed influential kind mm -hmm. of authority. You needed to, to lead people, not necessarily you know, manage them or you know, hold their position over. So talk a little bit about that. Like, how did you make that transition? You, you told us you went from that idea and then you got the idea and then you kind of switched it over. But what had to go through your mind? What what did you have to change about the way you were thinking about people? Because you spent a long time and we'll get to it later in a corporate world with a lot of positional authority. And now you really need to pivot over to that influence. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing about that. And I'm glad that you keyed into that because I think that's really important as people are working to grow to become better leaders. It is less about you. <laughs> I know people don't like it to hear that, but it's really less about you and more about the individuals that you're leading, which in the way that I would say it is the individuals that you're serving. Um, you know, they're not necessarily working for you. They're working for the mission. And that was the big pivot for me was that we're all aligned here because we're passionate about marketplace ministry. We're passionate about building disciples in the marketplace. We're passionate about helping Christian business grow. We're passionate about building Christian business in a way that makes an impact in the local communities and creates great influence when they come together. That's the passion. So I stopped thinking about why I'm here, what I want, my check, my exchange, my this, my this, and started to think about the mission. And I started putting the mission at the forefront of everything, almost like a broken record, the mission, the mission, the mission, the mission. And that's where people started to come in to serve the mission. They weren't there to serve me. They were there to serve the mission. And then of course, structuring in a way to be able to reach in and extract the greatest greatest advantage that the people would bring, which is their unique ability and their passion to serve. And that's where it became very successful. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's so good. There's so much there. Uh, I love the idea of you can, you can lead and, and 
put the mission first and yet still have some level of accountability and some systems and structures in place for effectiveness as long as you point it to the the, the ultimate, the customer, the, the members mm-hmm. in your case, as long as we can say, listen, this is not for us. This is in service of providing the best experience to our customer, to our, our member. And, and then that allows you to still have that opportunity to put systems and structures and accountability in place, which are so critical to have us work together effectively. Uh, it just, it's just, it's such, such good stuff because it, that can be really tricky. And, and I also think all this translates into just the corporate workplace as well. And that, that whole thing about, you know, you can't be about you. It's got to be about them, whether that's your team or your customers. It doesn't work otherwise. And, and no. people tend to forget that. And the corporate world tends to be much more structured around that idea of the person at the top is to be served, not to serve. So wow. yeah, such good wow. stuff. Well, That's cool. great. So, like, there's a really cool story. Something happened that was a, a good trigger point for me too, Ken. And, and hearing you talk, it reminded me of it. So we have events. We have a lot of events, almost a hundred a year, but we have larger events once a month. And we had this uh, individual in the chamber. And one month we had asked her, hey, could you just go out? I just envisioned people in the parking lot. So as people are coming up, they're getting welcome. They're feeling at home. They're excited. And she did that in service. And, and trust me, in Florida, it's hot. And so she was out doing that. She did a great job. And we didn't have the structure in place. We didn't have a formal, you know, everybody kind of knows who's on first. And so next month rolls around and I'm inside and I'm meeting and greeting and talking with people. And I look out the window and there she was again, out in the parking lot, serving, greeting. Nobody had asked her to do it. It was what she showed up to do. She wanted to do it and did it under her own authority because her heart wasn't aligned with that mission. Now, it was such a great opportunity for me to use her as an example to share with people why that heart is so important in this mission. Nobody asked her to do it, but yet she did it anyway. And I wanted to recognize her and really just honor her effort in doing so. And now she does it every single month for us. She's out in that parking lot. She loves it. She knows that's her role and she takes great pride in it. But when people show up to serve the mission just because they want to, not because they've even been asked, that's when something really incredible starts to happen with an organizational culture. And there's a culture of service there, especially when you take someone that does something like that and elevate them and highlight them and really showcase their effort. Now she wouldn't, didn't do it for that, but I wanted people to see that that's really truly what service looks like. And so it creates this culture of service in the organization through that volunteer team. Yeah, that's so good. That's such a great story. So have you noticed a difference in either how you work with people or just I'm curious how how it works and how you lead because you are so used to or were used to having again that positional authority with a bigger team and now you've got some paid people but a lot of volunteers what have you learned about working differently with the the paid team versus the volunteers or or maybe there's no difference oh there is there's a big difference actually um And so that's been a big lesson that I've learned in this role. I've I've learned more about leadership in this role than when I was leading 400 employees in the oil and gas world. Um, What I learned here is that when somebody is actually paid and working for you, it's very important that they're mission minded and that, you know, they're doing it for the bigger purpose and you're tapping into their skills and ability. Yes, 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 and yes. But as you have people that are working in your organization, there is a level of expectation. Now, difference, you inspect what you expect and you want to do that in the volunteer world so that your members are served, right? But when you have somebody that's working for you, you also want to help them strive to be better, set goals to improve. You want to push them out of their comfort zone. You want to lead them and encourage them to grow, not get comfortable to really root to the mission, but also there has to be a level of accountability there that is maybe a little bit stronger than what you would have for your volunteers. Mm -hmm. And so I started, the lesson I learned was I started to have feel a little accretion, meaning I was managing the employee 
like I was the volunteers and there was a little bit of lax that happened there. So as I started trying to launch different programs, move forward, push the pedal a little harder, this individual, because I had not had the accountability with them, it started to kind of pull back a little bit. And so it made for some great conversations, great leadership lesson for me personally, and uh, opportunity to really help somebody. The thing is, as a leader, our job is not to leave people where they are. It's to help them grow, see in them their greatest gifts. And if you just take your eye off of that, then you're not helping people to be successful and be the very best that they can be. And so that's really the goal of a a paid team is to really work with them and help them be the very best. Ultimately, you want people that are ready to take your job, take your role. That's what you're preparing people to do at all times. Right. Yeah. Leaders grow other leaders for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, that's so good. I want to dive into Uh, your previous career in a minute, but we'll do that on the other side of a short break. We'll be right back on the Clarity Advisor Show. Is your business where you want it to be or on track to get there? Clarity Advisors helps business leaders improve communication and get your team aligned and engaged for greater success. We specialize in helping you streamline your sales and operating systems to improve efficiency and grow your profits. Call or text Ken at 616-822-2998 to have a complimentary 12-minute call to see what some clarity could do for you. And welcome back to the Clarity Advisor Show. We're talking with Crystal Parker. And Crystal, tell me about your career prior to the chamber. You were in classic corporate America, actually a really big company in the utility, the oil and gas industry, and you had a huge team. I mean, hundreds of people. So talk about that, how you got into those roles. I know you started out in a, in a role that was a pretty small and it grew into something pretty big. So tell us about a little bit about that journey, and then we'll get into some of the specifics of things that you learned. Well, I'm a college dropout. I had 21 hours left, Ken, and left college and started over completely. And I was in a little town of 300 with my tail between my legs all the way back home. A town so small, it's one of those where everybody knows your name. Like, honestly, before I even got back in town with my car, people knew I was coming home because I failed. So that's really where I started my career as uh, someone that felt like a failure. And what else am I supposed to do but uh, look for work anywhere that I could? And so there was an opening with a temporary uh, company, a temp company, and they had a, a shelf stalker. So I started stocking shelves in a truck parts store that was a subsidiary of a large oil and gas company. It was a trial period of this truck parts store working, and within a year, they decided it wasn't a good fit. But just so happened to have a secretary position in a neighboring town for that gas company. I did good enough that I got an opportunity to become a secretary there. And so I was there for about two to three years um, and the bookkeeper ended up leaving. So it was me as the secretary and bookkeeper in an office with all men. And I remember going to my supervisor and saying to him, I'm really looking for more opportunity. I, I want to do more. Well, he looked around at the guys and the, the work that was there and just didn't see a woman being able to do that type of work and said, well, you'll have to take another office job somewhere else and you'll probably have to move. And so, and I didn't think anything wrong with it when he said it. I just, I did exactly what he said. I took another office job. I found one six and a half hours away and I moved and started in HR. So from HR, I went into supervision. From supervision, I went into gas sales. We were trading gas in the NYMEX and uh, basis differential. It was a really cool job. And then that very place where I was a supervisor, the director of the call center came open 
And I got that job. So now I, I skipped. I, be, I went from supervisor to director and skipped over manager. So the people that were my managers, I became their boss. And I was there for a short time. We did some great stuff. That was a union environment. And then I had a great opportunity to go to El Paso to be the vice president of operations and customer service for the whole state. So we had 47 cities on the west side of Texas that I was responsible for from everything from engineering service, corrosion, um, gosh, you name it. We were running the gas company and rates as well. And then we did, we changed, the organization changed from geographical uh, leadership to a function model. And so then I moved to Tulsa and had all of customer service for Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. So the U.S.'s largest natural gas distribution company, uh, I was responsible for customer service and collections at that point. And then they sent me to Harvard and I got this taste of business in a whole different way through innovation. I did finish my undergrad psychology, master's in marketing, and then they sent me to Harvard. And uh, I just was really curious and excited to go out and try to do something on my own. And the Lord had an amazing way of just shutting that door and moving me off into my own company and business. Excellent. That's such good stuff. Now, there's two specific places I want to go with this. And because I, I know some of these stories from you, from, uh, you know, just our history together. So when you first, let's go over the, you taking it over the call center. So you're, you were in HR and you skipped over a level of bosses and you became the boss of your bosses and, and you had come from HR. So tell us what happened and how you were treated at the call center level and then how you overcame that and some of the lessons you learned from that experience. Absolutely. So my first supervisor job, my mentor basically told me, you've got to go finish your degree. And then once I did that, she said, you really need to find this job in supervision. Uh, you've done a lot of individual contributor type of work. Now, I always thought of myself as an entrepreneur. So if it if it wasn't broke, I would break it and fix it and do it better. I would always be looking for ways to improve stuff. So I went to the call center as a supervisor. I came in from HR. Typically, they would hire people from within. And I was an outsider. And I was from HR. And at the time, there were a lot of grievances filed in that union environment. So it was already pretty choppy. And here comes this outsider who doesn't know the regulations. I didn't know the CIS system. And I just was not an uh, ideal supervisor if in that environment. However, I was the best for that environment, but I didn't know that. So I relied heavily on my people skills. I love people. I swing on that side of the pendulum as it relates to people, interactions. I, I just really find myself um, enjoying relationships and helping people be successful. This was a highly measured environment. So there was a lot of metrics. For example, Ken, we knew every cost per second. So if they breathed, they knew how much it cost. They would come in and put their headset on and plug in. And it was almost robotic in what what they were required to do and how we were required to manage in that environment. So there's a lack of trust. I don't really agree with managing people through just metrics and measurements. And I tried to do that, but I was miserable. They were not the nicest to me. And it was just, you imagine it was a, a pressure cooker. Something had to give. And what ended up happening was it was me. I got my headset. I went and sat in their little cubicles with them, plugged in and thought, I'm going to learn this job. I'm going to learn about that. And as I was sitting at their desk, I looked at their desk and I saw pictures of their family. Oh, who's that? Is that your child? I started to develop relationships and trust with these individuals in my team. And then I started to advocate for them. Let's have a team meeting. Let's start treating these people like humans. I understood at that point the power of measurement that I never understood before, metrics, measurement, and accountability at the workplace. But there was a light that was shining in terms of and an opportunity to build relationships with the human beings. And what that did was show me that that is so important to have balance between measurement and relationships when leading 
an organization. It was a lifelong lesson that I'm very passionate about for leaders to understand that you've got to have both. Oh, that's so good. Such a good story. Thanks. I, I love that. At coming in there, I can only imagine. And you were relatively young as well, right? So you've got outsider, young, uh, you know, non-union, uh, XHR, which is always making people skittish. And you got to come in there and try to build a team when they're, they're already beat down by metrics and yeah, how you overcame that. That's so good. And sitting down and getting to know people, building trust, building relationships. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you. So I want to move over now to the taking over when they changed it from a geographic basis to a functional basis. Mm -hmm. And now you've got a huge geography. So you were remote before remote was cool. How, so talk about how you had this team over three or four states that you had to keep track of and, again, build relationships and, and maintain trust with. How did you do that? And what were some of the things, again, that worked and maybe didn't work as you switch mm -hmm. from people you could go and see and sit with to people spread all over a huge region? Well, uh, that's that's the challenge. Uh, what was different about how I approach this than you know maybe somebody else would was I did I was familiar with the customer service in Kansas because I had come up from that organization. I had spent time in Texas and I was overseeing the customer service council before we went to that functional uh, job role. And every single person in the organization, every single person had a job change, title change, supervisor change, or location change. So when you're talking about change management, oh, there was a storm of brewing wow. because so many people were anxious about the changes that were taking place within the organization and this big reveal. So behind the scenes, I was already creating um, all of you know job titles, you know the systems, et cetera, et cetera. The really cool thing about it was. I knew that there were pockets of excellence in each one of the companies. This company did a great job on their web, web returns. This company had bilingual agents. This company was great at the collection process. So we, we were looking to be as alike as possible, but as different as necessary. And I, I would really call it divine intervention. I really believe that the Lord gave me this, but my vision was that we connect to the customers in the cloud, right? This is, and then we point to the open agent based off of their skill set and their ability. And there was a lot of work with the union to be able to do that because we just had one of the three companies was a union operations. So we had a lot of conversations to do that. And the thing is, is when, because I, I talk about this in my book, but when I first started in that role, my first order was to shut down the call centers and move it to one. That was my order. And it wasn't what I knew in my heart was the right thing to do for the regulators, for the communities, for the agents, for each of the companies. It just, it was not the right thing. And I really believe that if I would have done and followed orders and said yes, and, and went and did it anyway, that it would have been a, a quick uh, walking paper. I don't think that I would have survived long there. Uh, but instead, I, I wrote this complete customer service transformation. So when people realized that as I took that role, that their jobs were secure, that we wanted to really pull the competitive advantage out of their natural abilities, right? Where they were good, where they were passionate, where they were just killing it and really take those pockets and elevate them, that trust started to build in my ability to lead them. And they saw that, hey, she's not taken away from us. She's giving us more authority, more access. We did make the very first virtual supervisor. And this is before virtual was cool. And so we elevated that first virtual supervisor. I actually wrote an article about virtual leadership prior to COVID even coming in and, and how that you can be very successful as a virtual leader. And it is about connection. It's about helping them to understand you're there to serve them. Again, my people, and I say my people, people that work in my organization do not work for me. If you're doing it right, and I hope that your audience hears me here, you as the leader work for your people, you're the people in your organization. You work for them because you're oftentimes 
the, the buck stops with you, right? You're making the policy. You're making the rules. And they're the ones trying to serve the customers. And so if you're working for them, helping remove obstacles, remove barriers so that they can best serve the customer, make it easy to do business with you. If you see your role as I serve them, I help them so they can be successful and they can serve that customer, then the organization is working as a whole all together. And it doesn't matter if there's eight branches, eight different um, groups that are you know, separate, everybody's working as one. And that's how you bridge that divide. That's so good. That's so good. So much in there. We're going to have to all go back and rewind and listen to that whole section again. I love that. I wrote it down. They as different, I'm sorry, as, as alike as possible, as different as necessary for people leading groups of people doing similar roles. That just sounds like such gold right there. I love um, that. Thanks. So, yeah. So listen, most of the leaders uh, in our in our audience and the guests that come on are readers, and you are that as well. But you're also a writer. Tell us about your book. Yes, I wrote a book called "The Best Robot Wins." It ain't personal; it's just business. And I talk a lot in there um, through story. Uh, but what I've done in this book is help leaders structure their organization in a way to maximize the value of the human capital that's working in your organization. So there are different things that you need to do as you structure your company and your teams to be able to really extract that value from the humans that are working within your organization. And so it's the best robot wins. It ain't personal. It's just business. That's fantastic. And we'll have a link to your book where we where people can pick that up in the show notes. So, well, Crystal, this has been such a joy. I love getting together with you. You're always full of good stories and wisdom and such enthusiasm for everything. What you've learned, when you win, when you lose, you, you <laughs> never cease to be enthusiastic about it. If somebody wanted to reach out to you, maybe they're interested in something about the, the chamber, Central Chamber, uh, or uh, questions about leadership and, and how you do things, what would be a good way for people to connect with you directly? They can connect with me on my cell phone. I, If I miss you, I'll call you back. I have a great mentor that told me about that. And uh, it's both of our mentor, uh, Joe Peachy. Uh, my cell phone is 915-491-9898. And if you forget the cell phone, you can't forget the best robot wins. So if you just search for the best robot wins, pull up my website. You can find me there and contact me that way as well. Excellent. Appreciate that. And thank you so much for being here. This has been great. Thanks, Ken, for having me on. All right. We'll talk soon. And that brings us to the end of another episode of the Clarity Advisor Show. So thanks for joining us and we will see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Clarity Advisor Show. Clarity Advisors is a speaking, training, and consulting firm specializing in helping you simplify your sales and operating systems to improve efficiency and grow your profits. Connect with Clarity Advisors today to learn more about how they can help you improve communication and get your team aligned and engaged for greater success.